we will uh, we'll start our uh, discussion. We call it community time, actually, CT, not question time. Uh, and they always say about local news is no news. I think I say local news is new, the news. And we make the headlines. And uh, today we will have uh, uh, two guest speakers. And we will have, first of all, uh, they will give about seven to eight, ten minutes uh, presentation, both our guest speakers. Then it's your chance as well to put comments and questions for our guest speakers. I think we will run up to around uh, 6.30, uh, or 7.30, sorry, 7.30, and then we will have a break, maybe for 20, 25 minutes, and then we have uh, part two of the debate from maybe 8 o'clock to almost quarter to uh, 9, because we have to finish by uh, 9 o'clock. Uh, on my right, uh, I was actually going through the website of uh, the social resistance, and I was actually pulling out uh, something and they wrote in one of their, I think it was a conference, I believe a new perspective for socialists in Britain uh, they said the new political period the socialist risk conference in April will take under dramatically different conditions that in recent years in what is effectively a new political uh, period or era and part of the things they said we, are empty, we, empty, we have entered the period not only of deep crisis, but of mass uh, revolt. The powerful democratic revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt and those underway in Libya and other Arab countries at time of writing have exploded in the weak links, uh, weak links of capitalist globalization and are rapidly changing the world political uh, situation. And then they link it up this kind of revolution uh, to go to uh, Jordan, uh, what we see now in Syria, in Yemen, Algeria, all this kind of thing. But therefore we see this kind of uh, revolutions going around and therefore we will actually just... Uh, today, today case or our case study today is uh, Libya and when we look at the present now and how we see the future. And uh, without delay I think I start with uh, Roy uh, Wilkes is uh, from the Socialist Resistance and he will give us a presentation between 7 to 10 minutes about his thought and then we go to Azadim from the uh, Libyan Solidarity Campaign and we'll give him the same time and then it's your, your show therefore you can get your comments uh, through to everybody and as well a uh, question from my guest speakers I'll always remind my brothers and sisters we are in a debate so please watch your uh, language because it's on camera. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing is, is just we have uh, different ideas, different uh, thoughts. So we should respect each other and uh, the thought of everyone of us. Without delay, I want uh, Roy to speak. So you're welcome to speak. And thank you very much for coming. And thank you. And Assalamu alaikum, right. brothers and sisters, uh, comrades. And it's a very great privilege and honour for me to be here. Uh, sharing my own modest thoughts with uh, representatives of the great revolutionary people of Libya today. Um, I want to start by referring to an old saying that is, I think, taken far too literally by many people on the left, which is that my enemy's enemy is my friend. And I think it's taken too literally because if you think about it, for example, at the, uh, when many people around the world were rebelling against British imperialism and colonialism in the 1940s, would it have been fair to say that their friend was therefore the enemy of British imperialism, Hitler? And I don't think it would, because Hitler was the friend of nobody, and particularly not the friend of any uh, of the oppressed peoples of, of the British colonies. So I think this, this isn't very uh, applicable in many situations. The real world is much more complicated than this. And there are people on the left now who say, well, our enemy is British imperialism, American imperialism, and quite rightly so. And therefore, does that mean our friend is Gaddafi because he is now the enemy of Western imperialism? And there are some on the left who say, yes, that is the case. But I think, again, that shows that this generalisation is, is very, very inadequate because Gaddafi is the friend of nobody 
who wants uh, freedom, uh, democracy and liberation. And unfortunately there are people on the left in Britain and elsewhere who fall into that trap. There's a more subtle variation on this saying, which is, my enemy's friend is my enemy. And again, there are people on the left who don't necessarily support Gaddafi, but nevertheless draw what I think is the wrong conclusion now, which is that because uh, the people who are engaged in an uprising in Libya, because they are uh, now supported, supposedly, by Western powers, therefore they can no longer be really revolutionary. There are people who have come to meetings here, actually, and put that position forward. And again, I think that is a, is, is, is a wrong assessment, and I think it's a, a, an attempt to generalise a situation which is far more complex than that, and it's, it's not the right way of looking at things. And that way of looking at the world, in that very simplistic way, is what I would call campism. It's the idea that there are, there are two camps in the world. Those that are for, we're on that side, we're in this camp, and those that we're against. And this was put forward first, but most famously, uh, by Stalin, when he was the leader of the Soviet Union. And Stalin said, well, we're involved in a war against Hitler, so therefore everybody should be on the same side, and everybody should therefore be supporting those who are fighting Hitler. So what did he say to people in India, in other parts of the world uh, that were attempting to rebel against British imperialism? He said you have to stop fighting against British imperialism. You have to support Britain because they're in the same side as us now. And again, this was completely wrong. It was a, it was a falsification and an oversimplification. Of course the people of India should not stop fighting against British imperialism because their enemy was British imperialism. And it was right for them to fight against that colonial power. But the idea that the world is split into two camps is a great oversimplification. And now that's being used uh, by many on the left to oppose uh, the uprisings in, in Libya. Because they say that as soon as imperialism got involved in fighting Gaddafi, therefore that puts those uh, revolutionaries no longer in the camp of the revolution. They're on the other side. They're on the side of imperialism. And I think it's completely wrong. Um, we need to see what's happening in uh, the context uh, uh, of what's been happening across the whole Arab world. The uprising across the whole Arab world, uh, what I would describe as a democratic revolution. There's an uprising against the pro-imperialist dictatorships, starting in Tunisia and Egypt, also Bahrain, Yemen, now Syria and Libya, against pro-imperialist dictatorships. Now, that is a democratic revolution. It isn't yet a socialist revolution, it's a democratic revolution. But in the 18th and 19th centuries, these democratic revolutions were led by the bourgeoisie, by capitalists. They led these uprisings against feudalism. They tried to establish democratic nations in France, in the United States, in, in Britain, even in the, in the 17th century. Um, but things changed with the onset, with the, the uh, the onset of imperialism, things change substantially. And what we find now is that around the world, in countries that are oppressed by imperialism, the bourgeoisie is no longer capable of leading a democratic revolution. And we're seeing this happening now, for example, uh, in Egypt, where the, the bourgeoisie is trying to keep things as they were. The old regime still hasn't been fully overthrown in Egypt, and the uprisings are still going on. And what we've seen in places like uh, Egypt and Tunisia and Libya, that it wasn't the bourgeoisie, it wasn't the capitalists who led the uprisings, it was actually the working class and particularly the youth, students, young people who came onto the streets, who had the courage to come onto the streets and fight vehemently against the old order and the old regime. And uh, what we're seeing now in, in, in Egypt, of course, the masses taking to the streets again. What is unfolding is, I would describe it as a process of permanent revolution. Nowhere is this more clear than in Egypt, where, despite getting rid of a barrack, the job hasn't been done. That even the democratic demands that have been raised for uh, freedom from dictatorship, for universal suffrage, for free and fair elections, even these simple, basic demands haven't been met by the government that's replaced Mubarak. Uh, because 
the bourgeoisie, the capitalists in that country, are so firmly tied to imperialism. They still want the aid from the United States. They still want to be tied to the coattails of imperialism. Therefore, they're finding that they can't very easily get rid of uh, the old system and the old, uh, uh, the old methods. And um, what we need to do, we would say, is what we think needs to happen in Egypt and elsewhere in the Arab world is for the working class to take the lead and to take power. Because it's only then that we will be able to make sure, if the working class take the lead and take power, that we can make sure that the democratic tasks are met of universal suffrage, free and fair elections, free trade unions, and so on and so forth. Um, but if the working class take power in order to make these changes, democratic changes, then it wouldn't stop there. Because working people who are, in many cases, in many parts of the world, suffering extreme poverty, and in some cases even starvation, will not stop at that, uh, uh, will not limit themselves to those democratic demands. They will want fair uh, rewards for their labour, they will want the right to organise, they will want to, to take forward the social tasks of the revolution as well as the democratic tasks. And we see the Libyan uprising as part of this wider process that's unfolding across the whole of the Arab world. Now, we would distinguish to some extent between the mass movement that's emerged and that's led these struggles and the leadership that's been thrown up by that movement. And I would say the movement, including in Libya, is primarily working class in nature and in character and is thoroughly revolutionary uh, and has been led by the youth. But the National Transitional Council that's been thrown up by that is contradictory. I think it does contain elements of the old regime. It does contain some pro-imperialist elements. Therefore, the way that we would respond is to say that we offer critical but unconditional support uh, to that revolutionary movement. Um, so we, what does that mean exactly? It means that we are unconditional in supporting uh, the people of Libya. We're totally behind the revolutionary uprising in, in Libya. We call on all governments, including the United Kingdom government, to recognise the National Transitional Council as the legitimate transitional government in Libya, because that is the leadership that's been thrown up by this process. But we are critical, to some extent, of that leadership. Uh, for example, we would argue that it's relying far too much on Western powers. Um, and we can see the evidence of that in today. France is now calling for negotiations with Gaddafi, and for a settlement, uh, which, although it may remove Gaddafi as the figurehead, would leave the old regime uh, in power. Uh, France, the United States, Britain cannot be trusted. We all know that. I'm speaking among friends here. We all know that the imperialist powers can't be trusted. However, I do fear that there are elements within the National Transitional Council who may uh, be too far over to the side of those powers. Um, and also, I think we, could be we should be critical of the National Transitional Council to some extent for promising to honour Gaddafi's oil contracts. That's a great, potentially grave mistake to tie the future of the Libyan people uh, to the uh, commitments that were made by Gaddafi in terms of oil contracts, in terms of uh, debts and so on and such forth. So, what do we suggest instead? Well, we would, we would say that we should call on the support of revolutionaries across the Arab world for the Libyan uprising, and particularly from Egypt and Tunisia. The, uh, the silence of the Egyptian government in relation to what's happening in Libya is deafening. Why aren't they coming out and supporting the Libyan people? Um, they should be. Also, we should ally with the youth across the Arab world as a whole, with the youth in Egypt. These kind of links need to be built. Uh, with the labour movement in Egypt, because free trade unions are starting to develop in Egypt, and that's where we would want um, uh, uh, links to be made so that the pressure can be put on the Egyptian government to provide the kind of armed support for the Libyan people that is currently being provided by NATO. I think it would be far better to go from Egypt. What can we do to support the Libyan uprising? Well, we can give political support in our press and through our statements and so on and so forth. We can demand of the British government, as I've said, that they recognise the National Transitional Council. Uh, we can demand that they release all Libyan funds to the National Transitional Council. We can demand that they offer zero interest credit 
to the National Transitional Council for purchasing uh, medical supplies and food and arms as well. And we should demand that the British government licenses arms sales to the National Transitional Council. I think it's a big weakness of the United Nations Revolution, 1970 was it, that it actually imposes an arms embargo on everybody in Libya. Um, I'm, I'm opposed to that. I think we should be an arms embargo on Gaddafi, but we should be arguing very strongly for arms sales to uh, the, the, uh, the revolutionaries in Libya via the National Transitional Council. Um, where we go from here, because I think things are coming to a head, I think Gaddafi's days are numbered, and obviously there is a fear that uh, the Western powers will attempt to negotiate a situation where the old regime remains, despite Gaddafi going. Where we go from here, I think, is going to be the next part of the discussion. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a very nice.